I'd like to start uh, with a shout out to all the great Halloween costumes out there, <laughs> especially the stormtrooper in the fourth row over here. Um, so uh, uh, I also want to mention uh, next week's colloquium is Clem Pryke, P-R-Y-K-E, from the uh, University of Minnesota. And uh, Clem is going to be talking about uh, microwave background research from the South Pole. Uh, so with that done, uh, I'd like to introduce today's speaker. It's an honor to be able to do, introduce our friend and colleague, Fred Lamb. Um, uh, Fred is the uh, Brandon Monica Fortner uh, Professor of Theoretical Astrophysics Emeritus uh, and a, a faculty member in the Arms Control and Disarmament Program here at U of I. Um, Fred joined the University of Illinois in 1972 after doing his undergraduate work at Caltech and his graduate work at uh, Oxford, uh, where he stayed for a couple of years as a fellow of Modlin College. Uh, he then came to U of I and uh, has uh, had an extremely distinguished career here. Um, he's widely known for his work on uh, uh, relativistic and high energy astrophysics. Um, and he is the inventor of one of the standard models for accreting magnetized neutron stars, the Gaussian Lamb model. Um, he uh, was a leader in the development of a NASA mission uh, called the Rossi X-ray Timing Explorer, which uh, enabled uh, the timing of X astrophysical X-ray sources uh, at unprecedentedly short timescales millisecond timescales. Uh, and that led to many discoveries, uh, including the discovery of uh, what are called quasi-periodic -periodic oscillations uh, around stellar mass black holes. Um, he uh, is today involved with another NASA mission called NICER, which if you know Fred is very appropriate. And uh, the NICER uh, mission is uh, another X-ray observatory which is attached to the International Space Station and is also doing timing and spectroscopy of uh, uh, astrophysical sources. Uh, Fred uh, also has a long record of public service. Uh, so uh, public service related to national security and uh, arms control. And uh, he's, he's an expert on underground uh, nuclear explosions. Uh, and was deeply involved in negotiations for the uh, Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, which unfortunately has not been ratified by the United States, among others. Um, he uh, also co-led uh, an APS study on ballistic missile defense uh, about uh, 13 years ago, I think, um, and, uh, uh, and is widely recognized for that work, including by a uh, the Leo Szilard Award of the APS. Um, so uh, today, Fred is going to talk about <coughs> uh, threats to our access and use of near-Earth space. So, Fred. Hello, that's great, just in case, thank you. Good afternoon. <laughs> so I wanna thank, first of all, Charles for a very generous introduction, and uh, which I really appreciate. I hope in my talk this afternoon to persuade you that near Earth space is extremely valuable, uh, but also that it is under very serious threat today, uh, a growing threat, and that action by lots of different people is going to be needed in order to prevent us from losing our access to space. So let me just remind you, uh, it's 60 years since the first orbiting spacecraft, approximately, so 1956, but uh, there's been 
a huge increase in the use of space. One of the things that distinguishes space, uh, it's not only extremely valuable, as I'll try and persuade you, increasingly valuable, but also it's a very fragile environment. And I'll try to persuade you of this. That's a very important point because um, in my interactions with, particularly with folks in the defense sector and the military, they, uh, some of them, actually some of the civilians even more aggressively than the generals, uh, advocate that space is just like any other battlefield, land, air, and sea. And I believe that we can show that that is absolutely not the case. Um, so what we face are threats due to inter inadvertent interference with and damage to the integrity and functioning of space assets, by which I'm referring to space uh, orbiting things, instruments and satellites and so on of all kinds. Uh, but also there are um, plans to interfere with deliberately and damage space assets. And I think unless we manage these threats, as I'll show you, we will lose the use of space for hundreds of years, if not longer. So um, let me just make the case that straight space is actually extremely valuable. I think in some ways this might go without saying, but I really want to document it. Near-Earth space is uniquely suited for a wide range of, of uses. Um, the use of space for commercial, government, um, military, and civil, that includes scientific purposes, is increasing really rapidly. Um, the International Space Station and other space stations with humans on board are and will be uh, orbiting in near-Earth orbits. These orbits are also crucial for Earth observation and for small astronomy and astrophysics missions, which are, of course, close to my heart. Um, the nicer mission that was referred to is on board the International Space Station in a low Earth orbit. I just mentioned in passing that future large astronomy and astrophysics satellites will be placed in much higher orbits, things like the James Webb Space Telescope and NASA Infrared Astronomy Mission, Athena, which is a joint European Space Agency, NASA X-ray Astronomy Mission, and LISA, which is a, again a joint ESA, NASA Gravitational Wave Astronomy Mission. But lower Earth orbits are extremely important for not only science, but for other activities. So let me give you some idea. Here is uh, the countries that had satellites in orbit in 1966, which is 10 years after the launch of Sputnik 1. And the, the color coding here, the, the hash, I'm colorblind, but I think it's red, um, shows the countries with space launch capability. And at that time, they were three. The United States, the Soviet, former Soviet Union, then the Soviet Union, and France, and that was it. The United States also, as a courtesy, launched satellites for several other countries, um, Great Britain, Canada, and Italy, and that was it. So let me go ahead now, and I'll just flash to the current situation, 2016, so 50 years later, and just see the difference. So there's now nine countries with their own space launch capability, and you can see there's more than 30 countries, actually, that have satellites in space today. So it's an incredible increase. So this is also indicated by this plot, which, which shows you vertically the number of nations and government consortia that are currently operating in space as a function of calendar year. From 1957, this ends actually in 2010, this plot from U.S. National Security Space Strategy document. But you can see just a steady increase during this whole period. And that's due to the value of operating in space. So what are the purposes and users of the current space satellites? Well, here are the main purposes. Um, communication satellites, about 800, an increase of 7% over last year. Earth observation, about 660, up 11% in one year. Technology development and demonstration, 213, up 10%. Navigation and positioning, 120, up 12%. Space science and observation, 76, constant over the last year. 
Earth Science 23, almost the same as last year. So down below, I've listed the users. And so some people are a bit surprised by this. But of course, the commercial sector is enormous. It's about 826 satellites. Governments are next with 523. The military is about 400. And civil applications, science of all kinds, and other civil applications, about 140. So it's an incredibly large number and also very widely used. So um, to give you some idea of the, the dollar value of space activities, um, this is a, just a segment. So in 2014, which is now out of date, it's increased substantially in the meantime. The total market value estimated for space activities in that year was $330 billion, of which about $800 million was government activities and about $2.5 billion commercial activities. So just to give you an example of particular interesting activities, I put the plots for communication and for remote sensing broken out here. And so you can see it, it's increasing steadily. So this is this, this year now. Um, the cumulative or compound annual growth rate is about 9%. And if that's extrapolated for another five years, it will practically double in value. For remote sensing, the annual growth rate is 17%. And so here we are here today with about $4.5 billion um, in five years, it could be $12 billion. So this is, this is actually a huge, important sector. So I want to take a moment before going on. I'll be talking about a variety of different kinds of orbits. And so there's really many different ones, but we can break them down into three categories. Uh, low Earth orbit, which is defined as orbits between 100 and about 1,500 kilometers above the Earth's surface. It's measured from the Earth's surface. Um, medium Earth orbit, 5,000 to 10,000 kilometers. Geostationary orbit, 36,000 kilometers. Of course, that's the orbit which, if a satellite's placed in that orbit in the plane of the equator, its orbital period will be equal to the rotational period of the Earth. So the satellite appears to be fixed in the sky from any, any place on Earth. That's very important for broadcast satellites and many military applications and commercial applications. Another kind of orbit is highly elliptical orbit. Um, these are ones which uh, are for special purposes. Uh, a common one is called the Monaya orbit, which was invented by Dr. Monaya. And it actually can be put in elliptical orbit such that it will go up to uh, quickly uh, when it closely approaches the Earth and then slows way down as it goes out, and it hangs suspended. And this is particularly useful for communications and other purposes for the near Arctic regions, which otherwise, like geo, is not visible and not useful. Um, so uh, those orbits are used for those purposes. Um, the set, you know, serious radio service, for example, uses these kinds of orbits. And you can put it in an orbit that has a period of 12 hours, so it comes around repeatedly um, in a regular way. So let, let me just talk a little bit more about the current space satellites in orbit. According to the United Nations, on August 22nd, the latest count, there were 4,857 Earth orbiting satellites, which is up 5% more than this last year. Um, but only 40% of the satellites now in orbit are still operational. Of the 63% are in low Earth orbits, 30% in geo, 6% in medium orbits, and 2% in these highly elliptical orbits. So currently, as of this year, 70 countries have launched satellites, and six are currently operating satellites. So about 30% of the world's countries have operating satellites. Some of the, most of them launched by countries, nations, um, some launched by institutions such as the European Space Agency. There are about 450 objects launched in 2017, which is twice as many as were launched in any year before 2013. So that gives you some idea of the great increase in the use of space. And actually, this number, 450, represents 
more than 5% of the objects ever launched into space, and that's just in one recent year. So I'll give you a little example of new developments in space, and that's, this is an example, Planet Labs. So this was founded in 2010 by three former NASA scientists with funding from Kickstarter. And the first thing they did was they launched four Earth observing CubeSats in 2013. Their approach was fundamentally different from the usual approach. They basically built satellites with ordinary everyday electronics. They used car batteries for the batteries. The idea was to build them as cheaply as possible. And if they didn't always work, you just had many of them. So you didn't need to worry about that. So they were very cheap and very small. Um, it was incredibly successful in attracting venture capital. And by two years later, 2015, there was a fleet of 131 of them uh, in orbit. And then with the resources they gained, in 2015, Planet Labs acquired Black Ridge's Rapid Eye satellite constellation. And two years later, acquired Google SkySat constellation. So these are somewhat heavier, more capable satellites. Um, so by last this last month, they had launched 298 satellites. 150 of them are still active, and most are in sun-synchronous orbits. So these are the orbits over the pole that allow a satellite to pass over a given location on Earth at the same time of day every time. So the, every day. So the result is you don't have to worry about changing shadows and so on from the sunlight. Everything that is produced by sunlight remains the same, so you can easily see if there are changes in the structures on the ground and so on. So these are also the intelligence gathering orbits as well. So all, all spy satellites, for the most part, are in those kinds of orbits. Um, this uh, company has an open data policy, and it will supply sub-meter resolution satellite imagery, including 30 frame per second video clips of any place on Earth many times a day for a, a cost, but it's not a very large cost. So this has completely changed the security as well as other situations. People can use this information to study crops, to study development of all kinds and so on, but also it means there's no secrecy as far as military deployments are concerned. Something like happened in the first Iraq war, where the US deployed military forces as a feint, looking like a direct attack on Baghdad. But most of the forces were off to the side and came in a sort of roundhouse way. That, that would be impossible today as a secret thing, because everybody could see exactly what's happening. So this is information that up until the last few years was extremely closely held by all countries that had the capability to do Earth intelligence gathering. So this has just dramatically changed the situation in many ways. Um, so I'll give you a couple of examples of, this is an example of a, a solar power farm in Goldman, China. And so this was a photograph taken by uh, one of the CubeSats um, December 2015. They were starting to build this solar farm and you can now see it. Uh, two years later, it's basically completed. So, you know, you, you can see exactly what's going on on the ground at high resolution. Um, let me show you another overhead satellite photograph. This is from a, a SkySat. This has a ground resolution of about, about two feet. So very high ground resolution. Um, okay. And I haven't magnified it as much as you can, but um, this is actually an overhead photograph of Boston in 2015, the city. And you can see pleasure craft right here really clearly. You can probably even begin to type them. These are the automobiles that are parked on the side of this street. Okay, and with the 30 frame per second video, you can see trucks and cars and everything moving around. Just this is a whole new situation. So let me, having hopefully persuaded you about how valuable space is, to turn to my second point, which is that space 
is extremely vulnerable. It's much more easily damaged than the Earth's land, sea, or air environments. Um, why? Well, one of the reasons is that the regions of the most valuable orbits have very weak cleansing mechanisms. That is, if there is junk or debris, it takes a very long time for it to come down. The main way in which it comes down is atmospheric drag. So at 300 kilometers, that happens in a few years. At 500 kilometers, it takes decades. Um, there's not much air up there at those altitudes. Um, another point is that the most valuable orbits actually, I mean, space is a big place, but the valuable orbits occupy a relatively small fraction of that space. Um, so that means that a tremendous amount of damage can be done if a small volume of space is actually unavailable. As a result, the usefulness of space can be ruined by a very small number of destructive events. And I'll document that in, in the next few minutes. So one of the things I want to emphasize is that even small particles in orbit can be very destructive because they have very high relative velocities. So a typical relative velocity of, of objects in orbit would be like, say, 7 to 15 kilometers per second. And at those speeds, when they interact with a, a space craft, they will deposit as much energy as exploding 10 times their mass of TNT. It's incredible. So the you know, example of uh, even a single hit by a one centimeter particle, like a marble-sized particle, can entirely disable a large satellite or a crew module. So this, I think, illustrates things that are just like paint chips can cause serious damage to, you know, to uh, manned spacecraft and to other assets in space. Um, I'm going to come to demonstrate some things that have happened that have already deprived us of uh, the margin of safety. But I just comment that if two satellites collide in space, which they have, the energy released is about equivalent to 10 tons of TNT. So one of the problems is inadvertent interference with or damage to space assets, and it's a growing problem. The most valuable orbits and radio bands are becoming crowded, and that leads to a higher likelihood of the spacecraft interfering with one another physically, but also the radio bands are very crowded, so there's a problem with uh, them interfering electromagnetically. Um, there are efforts to take account of this. I believe, believe me, there are huge cooperative organizations in place already of the operators of these space assets that are in tight communication to prevent, if they can, the kind of disastrous damage that could happen. But operators can lose control of satellites, especially near their end of life, causing them to approach and interfere with or collide with another satellite. One of the most serious problems is that Carelessness and failure to dispose of satellites at their end of life is creating enormous amounts of space debris and danger from that. Um, when you have collisions between space junk, then it multiplies the space debris. And because even small objects can cause enormous damage, then when you break up a large structure into smaller pieces, then you produce danger in a much larger volume, a swath of space, and that continues to multiply. So uh, let me give you some sense of the Earth orbiting debris and how it's increasing. So this is a video that I'll start in a second, which shows you only the objects with dimensions of greater than 10 centimeter, and that's because these are the objects that are individually tracked by the U.S. Spacecom Space Surveillance Network. So it runs from 1957 to 2015, and you'll see year by year. So this is 1957 at the beginning, and so this is Sputnik 1 and Sputnik 2 that you can see. Now, of course, to show the satellites, their sizes are not correctly represented. They're made large enough that you can actually see them. 
So we'll go through and start the video now, um, which is just illustrating the growth in the numbers. So this ring, uh, of course, near the outside here, that's geosynchronous. And so even though that's a large radius, the, you know, the satellites are in a very, very narrow volume out there. So that is one of the places where collisions are a danger. But there's also a serious danger of collisions in near-Earth orbit. As you can see, it's un incredibly crowded. So let me give you some more sense of that. So. These are just, again, the Earth at orbiting catalog objects cataloged by the Space Surveillance Network. So again, we start here in 1970, a total of 1,800, 1980, 4,600, 1990, almost 7,000, 2,000, 9,600, and by 2010, 22,000. And it's continued to grow. So what are they? Well, there's rocket bodies which were left behind and not deorbited, so usual final stages. Um, there are spent payloads and active payloads. Um, there's some that we don't know exactly what they are. And then there's smaller debris, um, and they're plotted here. But you can see this enormous growth. Now, I call your attention to uh, the steepness of the curve here. And this is due uh, in almost entirely to just two events, which I'll discuss in a little bit more detail. One was the Chinese test of an anti-satellite weapon against one of their satellites in orbit. And that um, increased the amount of space debris in a very dangerous situation, actually intersecting the International Space Station, uh, increased it by uh, about 30% just with these sides of objects. And then there was an inadvertent collision of an Iridium communication satellite, with an, which was active, but with uh, an inactive and out-of-control Cosmos Soviet satellite. And that increased the amount of debris again. So those two events increased the total amount of space debris of these sizes by about 40 percent. 40 percent. And just you know, that one was in 2007, the other in 2009. So you can see just how dangerous this kind of event is. So let me give you a little bit more details. The estimated space debris uh, by size in January 2017, about 29,000 objects of dimensions greater than 10 centimeters. That's about four inches. And those are tracked individually. Um, the modeling of space debris there's general agreement that there are about 750,000 objects with dimensions between one centimeter, like a marble, and four inches in diameter, and about 170 million in the range from one centimeter to one millimeter. And even those one millimeter objects can be extremely damaging to space structures on orbit. So um, this is a plot of, uh, from the ESA Space Debris Report last year. Uh, it's a model of the space debris population. So this figure shows um, the distribution in near the Earth of objects that are greater than a marble size. And this is uh, the distribution of those that are like a millimeter in size. And they're color-coded according to what the source was thought to be. So let me talk about this uh, satellite collision, the Iridium-33 Cosmos 2251 collision um, on February 20, 10th of uh, 2009. Uh, these are both communication satellites. They collided at 12 kilometers per second over northern Siberia. Um, and as a result, uh, 5,600 larger than four inch fragments have been cataloged by the Space Surveillance Network. Um, and four years later, almost 5,000 of those were still in orbit. Um, as an example of the threat, um, on March 24th of 2012, so that's uh, three years after the event, 
six crew members on the International Space Station had to take refuge inside the two docked Soyuz spacecraft until a dangerous piece of this collision debris had passed. It was large enough to be tracked. Um, so they were alerted. Um, unfortunately, this collision occurred partly because at that time, there was no effort to warn and alert space operators of collision risks. So the Cosmos satellite was out of control. The Soviets just left it there. They had no, they had no power, no communication. The Iridium was under control, but they ha did not know that they were on an orbit that was about to collide with the Cosmos satellite. So here I'll show you uh, the orbits here show you the Iridium constellation, and now I'll show you a numerical simulation of this collision. So you'll see uh, the collision first close up from two different angles, and then uh, the camera backs away and you see what the overall result was. So this is the Iridium 2033, that's what it looks like in here. Here's the Cosmos 2251. They're approaching now. So uh, typically at these very ultra high velocities, so now we're looking down a bit more, the debris clouds continue on essentially the same path as the two colliding objects. But now they orbit the Earth and guess what? They're going to intersect again. So they again, and they, the objects in this cloud collide with each other and produce a cascade of spray and debris. So now they're coming and intersecting again over. Um, so this is color-coded to show the new debris, which is about 30% of the total debris that's being shown here. So that was just one event. Um, so as a result of this event, um, it was decided that there has to be an effort to provide collision warnings. Um, so there are about 30,000 satellites, rocket bodies, and other human-aid objects larger than four inches, 10 centimeters, now in orbit. And I mentioned these other numbers for smaller debris, which are also extremely dangerous, but are not tracked. So the first category, you can have warnings issued, but for the others, you can't because they're not tracked for the most part. So most of these objects are either in low Earth orbit or they're in geosynchronous. So to give you an example, last year, the Space Surveillance Network logged 309,000 close calls between space debris and active satellites or spacecraft. And they issued 655 emergency reportable alerts to operators to be prepared to take evasive action. So the operators are all in communication with the network and so on. They're you know, monitoring all the time. They're taking evasive action, but it's, it's very costly, but also it's not certain to succeed. And especially if you have spacecraft that are not currently active. So one of the things that we could do, one of the most effective things we can do, as I'll show you, is actually to pay attention to end-of-life mission, end-of-mission disposal of the spacecraft. Now, already there are international guidelines that are accepted for mission disposal. But this plot shows you that this is not succeeding for the most part. So this is the total amount of mass involved in each of the spacecraft involved, and this is year by five-year intervals. Um, so this color shows the amount of total mass that was, this is in percent, for which there was absolutely no effort whatsoever to dispose of the space asset at end of life. Um, this d darker color, like here and over here, shows that there was a nominal attempt, but it was insufficient and did not actually succeed in getting rid of the threat. Um, so this other color is successful attempts, and then there's some spacecraft by their nature that are naturally compliant 
in the sense that they will deorbit in a relatively short period of time. I mean, I might mention that there's been a, a lot of talk about the CubeSats because they're being put up by the hundreds, and Space uh, Planet Labs uh, has an end of life commitment to deorbit them. And for these little small satellites, it's relatively easy. They just blow up a big balloon, and that produces enough atmospheric drag for these small satellites to deorbit relatively quickly within months or a year or so. But for larger spacecraft, it's a much more challenging thing. You have to have usually stored propellant that you didn't use to achieve orbit to be able to deorbit the spacecraft, and that's economically disadvantageous. You would like to use the minimum amount of propellant and use it all up, and the rest of it is, is operating structure and electronics and so on. But this is a very dangerous thing and is causing the problems that we have today. So I think one of the things we need to do is to really um, enforce uh, requirements that anything that's launched into space have a definite end-of-life plan that has been verified as going to be successful. So what could that do? Well, here's a plot uh, by the ESA Space Debris Report from that report showing the number of collision fragments. Uh, so um, this is uh, in the future, um, and it shows that uh, if you had no post-mission disposal, so that's this color, then it's going to grow exponentially. But if you had uh, even 90% of the missions uh, obeyed the post-mission disposal guidelines, then it would flatten out and approach a constant. So this is just not necessarily the, the only thing we need to do, but it illustrates that if we could actually require this, that in the long run, we would be in much better shape. Another thing that I think is very relevant is that there are only nine countries that have space launch capabilities. So that means this is a very small problem in the sense that there are a very small number of control points. Um, so some of these don't actually launch hardly any spacecraft. But therefore, if we could get just these nine countries to sign up to this, then it would change the situation. Um, I've also had contact with commercial operators and people in, say, SpaceX, uh, making the point that their whole, their whole business model requires them to be able to have a possibility of launching many missions into space and charge for it. But nobody's going to want to launch spacecraft into space if they're going to be destroyed almost immediately. So they have a commercial long-term incentive to make sure that any spacecraft that they launch has an end-of-mission plan. Um, so it's a, somewhat of a tough sell. But I think we, the governments and others, organizations, have to get involved. So let me turn to another issue, which is the military threat. Um, and I just want to begin by distinguishing clearly between two different types of military space assets. So first category are assets that carry out themselves directly destructive actions. And I refer to these, and most people do, as weapons. Um, then there are assets that don't themselves carry out destructive actions, even though they may assist weapons that do. So you know, we can think of lots of them. I mean, basically, um, you know, global positioning satellites um, Communication, military communication satellites are in the second category. So I think we, it's really important to distinguish these. There's, and many of the satellites in the second category are dual purpose, so like the GPS. I mean, it has huge civilian application, but also obviously very important military application. So I don't think it is possible or makes sense to try to restrict that second category, but I think it's really vital that we prevent weapons from being deployed in space um, because, among other things, it will increase the likelihood that space assets will be attacked and the weapons themselves are targets in case of conflict for attack and very few such attacks will prevent us from being able to use space near the Earth for hundreds of years. 
We cannot take that risk. Another point is that there's a huge asymmetry between states that heavily depend on space sets and those that don't. So the United States, for example, and European countries, others depend incredibly for their domestic economy as well as their military capability on space assets. There are many other countries, some of them have the possibility of launching destructive attacks on space assets that are nowhere near as dependent on them. So that creates a risk that a country that doesn't depend on them would actually undertake to destroy assets. So what are the de deliberate interference and damages that could occur? Um, jamming of the transfer of satellite control signals or data uh, to other satellites at ground station, damaging satellites using kinetic or laser anti-satellite weapons, uh, creating electromagnetic pulse or releasing radioactive materials. Any country that could launch a substantial mass into orbit could damage a satellite or by dispersing sand or something like that, just completely block huge swaths of near Earth space and make it unusable. So for military satellites, we're already, and other countries too, taking measures to protect them. So you can harden them against radiation. Uh, there's a tendency now to move to larger numbers of smaller satellites, so it's not so easy to, by attacking one satellite, uh, cause a huge disruption. But this is very expensive and it therefore may not be feasible for commercial or civil satellites. So let me give you an example of <clears throat> the kind of thing that could happen again or even more if there was an attack in space. This is the Chinese ASAT test, which in itself generated over 35,000 pieces of debris down to one centimeter in size. And I show this because I think it illustrates that placing weapons in space could threaten existing space assets and would invite the use of ground, air, and space-based weapons against these space-based weapons, and that would potentially create catastrophic results. <clears throat> so this is, again, a simulation of the attack on this Fenyang weather satellite by an interceptor launched by the Chinese. So you can see that's the interaction right there, the attack and the destruction of the satellite. But now you see this debris cloud begins to spread out. And you'll see in a moment uh, in this simulation, uh, they go to the International Space Station and show you it in orbit. And in a moment, you'll see the interaction of the space station with this debris cloud. So it happened almost immediately. <clears throat> So this is the debris cloud here, and the trajectory of the space station goes right through it. <clears throat> and it goes through it repeatedly. And the debris cloud continues to spread out around, around the orbit. So, let me turn to a related question, which is now resurfaced again. It comes up about every 15 years. Um, I want to argue and try to persuade you that space-based missile defense is not a good idea. Why is it so attractive? Well, there are two basic reasons. One is it's seen as a global system that could defend against attacking missiles launched from anywhere on the globe. Secondly, it would seek to intercept long-range ballistic missiles during their so-called boost phase, which is the first three to five minutes of flight when the engines are burning. And the key point here is that that's before they would normally, although not if they were designed to do differently, but typically they're not able to deploy decoys during that phase. And it's the decoys which make um, intercept by our current systems essentially impossible to be reliable. So that looks attractive, but in reality, such a system would be impractical and dangerous. Um, it was studied by the APS study that I helped lead. It's been more recently studied by the National Academy of Sciences that drew very heavily on our study and came to the same conclusions. So um, it would take from 500 up to several thousand orbiting launch platforms 
in order to produce, create a thin defense against ICBMs from North Korea alone. And that's you know, something that both the studies found. There's three basic reasons. The first is that because you're going to have to attack this, the missile within the first three or four minutes, then you have to have an interceptor platform that's close to the intercept point to get there in time. Second reason is that satellites or plat launch platforms in orbit do not stand over the launch site. This is something which has escaped the notice of a remarkable number of people, um, one of whom was Richard Pearl, who was part of the Star Wars program in the Reagan administration, so you'd think he would have learned something. But in early 2000, he advocated strongly, and he wrote an opinion piece in the New York Times talking about how we had to move away from the ground-based defense to a space-based defense because we could just put a satellite over the launch site of North Korea and that would take care of everything. Uh, well, it, it can't because the satellite moves on an orbit. So also, there's another problem. The Earth rotates under the orbit. So even if you have an orbit that goes over the launch site at one time, a few hours later, it's out of reach. So deploying a, such a system that would be required would require five to 10 times the current US space launch capability and even an austere system, so-called, with very limited capability, would cost at least $300 billion initially, which is about 10 times more than any estimates for a terrestrial alternative. And there'd be still more cost to maintain it in orbit. But also, such a system would be vulnerable to the kind of anti-satellite weapon that I discussed before, and it would attract such a weapon. Or there could be space mines put in orbit next to these platforms and just waiting there for a time to explode and destroy the platform. You know, what, wh what is the policy on things like that? It's very dangerous and threatening. But also, you could easily overcome it by doing a salvo launch. So you launch three or four missiles at about the same time. There's only one platform you know, in these thin defenses that's within reach. So the maybe you hit the first one. Chances are not necessarily perfect but you would have no chance at the second, third, and fourth ones because you've used up your interceptor. So um, this is a video that illustrates the problem of placement. So this is uh, a satellite orbit, and this would be a launch platform passing near the launch site in North Korea. Um, and you know that's relatively, you know, 90 minutes is the period to go around. But you can see that within a few minutes, the satellite is out of range of the launch site. So you have to put at least 50 platforms on each orbit, but unfortunately, the Earth is rotating under the orbit. So you have to have, even for a very thin defense, uh, about 10 orbits. So you're now up to 500 launch platforms. But this very sensitive to the assumptions about the attacking missile and other things. So you can easily get to thousands of launch platforms and still um, not have absolute assurance that you could actually hit the rising ICBM. So let me turn to the final topic briefly, uh, a US Space Force. So the first point I want to make is there's this talk about US Space Command. This is actually an old idea. It's been around for a long time. It was actually implemented. So in, in 1985, the US Space Command was created. It was a unified combatant command, which means it drew from all the military services. And the idea was to consolidate the space activities of all US armed forces. And that persisted for 17 years until 2002. But in response to the 9-11 attack, Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld decided to create a new unified command, the US Northern Command, responsible for North America. But he made the arbitrary decision, maybe for economic reasons or whatever, that there could only be 10 unified commands. And there were already 10, so he had to do away with one of them. So what he did was he eliminated the US Space Command. Of course, the functions weren't eliminated. They were just broken up and distributed to, other to the various services. Um, so what we have now is, in August, uh, President Trump signed a law that reestablished the US Space Command and as a subcommand under STRATCOM until it can be made into a, a, a true unified command. <coughs> 
So th this is just, uh, so there's some expense involved in this. Shifting things around, you know, is some disruption and so on, but that, that's really not a big deal. Um, the problem is what does this intention of what it does? For example, on August 9th, uh, Vice President Pence announced plans for a space force that would be the sixth branch of the US military. So if it becomes a separate branch, that's only a cost issue and some you know, disruption and disorganization. You have to figure out what their uniforms look like and what their medals will look like. And you have to make new uniforms and all that. Um, so yeah, but th so that's maybe a concern. But I'm concerned much more about what else he said. Um, he said that our adversaries are making advances in space warfare. Um, so I'll take these in turn. In my view, these remarks are deeply misguided, dangerous, and irresponsible. And why? Well, for one thing, the advances that he referred to were a development of a hypersonic cruise missile. Well, a cruise missile is an air-breathing missile that flies in the atmosphere. It's not in space. So uh, it's not going to be easily attacked by something in space. So that doesn't really seem to relate. Um, as a justification. Now, there are hypersonic uh, glide missiles that would go into low space, and in principle, a boost phase intercept could help with that problem. But as I've shown you, the boost phase in space, attacking boost phase from space is a not a good idea. It's difficult or impossible from the ground as well, but certainly not a good idea in space. Um, but then he stated, just as we've done in ages past, the United States will meet the emerging threats on this new battlefield, and then talked about waging war in near-Earth space. And I think, hopefully, I've convinced you that the consequences of doing something like that would be catastrophic for the use of space, and it, the, the, the cleansing time is hundreds of years. So can we prevent near-Earth space from being ruined? Um, I think it's clear we need to manage three different kinds of threats. Inadvertent threats to satellites and spacecraft created by the high levels of traffic and spacecraft operations and the in inadvertent loss of control. There's also the inadvertent threats posed by space debris, and I've talked about how those could be mitigated. And then the intentional threats to interfere with and damage or destroy satellites or space assets. So how can we manage these different threats? Um, the inadvertent threats are being managed relatively well, but they're becoming more serious. Um, so I'm advocating that we use the limited availability of, of availability of space launch services now and for the foreseeable future as a control point where we can enforce end of life plans and make sure that they're executed. There are other things we can also do. As for the intentional threats, my own view is that I don't think we can preserve the usefulness of near Earth space by the threat or use of force. The whole history of trying to do things like that in other environments indicates a great danger of actual destruction and warfare. And in space, that would be a catastrophe. So I think, as one aspect, we cannot allow any country to place weapons in orbit. For this part, I think the best approach will be a combination of informal cooperation and formal international agreements. Um, based on the fact that all nations have inherent strong interest in protecting access to space. Thank you. <laughs> so. It depends on what level. At the highest levels, I'm not sure they understand. At the next levels down, they do. I mean, Secretary of Defense Mattis was very strongly opposed to even creating a unified space command, let alone all the rest of it. Um, so, but he, you know, when the president spoke, then he said you know, he would, of course, uh, uh, follow the direction of the commander in chief. I, I would say, generally, um, my interactions with the military and with civilians in the defense sector about these things, um, th it's very various. 
So uh, many of the military folks are very concerned about the same issues I'm talking about, but some just view it as another battlefield, and they're adamant about it. And there's, you know, they would say that you're just being naive. Um, but I found in, in my interactions sometimes in, in you know, advising situations where there were several of us there and experts in the military, some of the civilian people were incredibly aggressive about saying that this is just another battlefield. Um, so it's very various. Well, they're thinking about doing that, but it's actually extremely challenging because the, uh, I'm not aware of any practical method. People are thinking about it and trying things out. But the problem is uh, these things are moving at 10 kilometers a second, and it's extremely difficult to actually position something to co-orbit with a piece of debris. It's very costly, and if you don't position it, um, the interaction will just cause a spray of additional debris. So it's, it's, it's far from clear how to address this problem that, of the debris that's already there. If they're really big chunks that you know, are on a very threatening orbit, like threatening something incredibly valuable like the International Space Station, you might think of setting up a, 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 an interceptor to co-orbit with it and actually attach you know, a booster to deorbit it or something else. But I'm, there's no real uh, solution that I'm aware of. Yeah. Could you put in a counter rotating motor something that would disperse slowly water with a lower vapor pressure? That where you would have the, the debris passing through, it would, in effect, an atmosphere brought to high level and lose enough energy to disperse water, say, in the air for years? So, I, I, I mean, in principle, that's possible. So, the question is, you know, how much it's a, space is a big place. So, it's difficult to conceive of launching enough material to actually have any significant effect. Yeah. Yes. Right. At present, there is no actual restriction. So if you have to have some permissions for the, you know, the local countries and stuff, but there's no international coordination or you know, requirement. For example, this is a, a voluntary recommendation about currently about the end of life, but there's no actual uh, agreement that allows that to be enforced in any way. They, they, well, they have to get permission to perform the launch, but there's nothing to do with the end of life permission. Um, so, th so this could be changed. But, I mean, one of the difficulties is that to actually verify that you have a workable end of life plan is actually very intrusive. So there, for commercial things, there may be proprietary concerns and so on. You ha these can be solved. I think for military spacecraft, then th that's so sensitive that there's not ever going to be really a possibility of inspecting them in the same way. So we have to figure out some other way to do that. But if, you know, military that are very dependent on space communications assets and, and surveillance and so on, they have a big incentive not to allow this to become impossible. Part of it's recognizing the threat and accepting it. Well, th there was a huge outcry and reprobation and other consequences that were communicated to the Chinese. I think that my my sense is that there is zero chance that they will ever do anything like that again. Um, so this was all kind of under the weather, um, under the radar. But uh, that, that's, the problem is that 
I'll give you another example. At this uh, defense forum that I was out, where I was the, in, in Britain, the keynote speaker, um, everyone, after the discussion, after my, my talk, you know, there's discussion, everyone agreed that testing an ASAT weapon was a terrible idea for everybody. Universal uh, agreement. But I happen to know that the Indians are thinking of doing such a test. And there was a representative from India, actually a civilian, not in the military, but representing. Uh, and so I, and she was sitting beside me, and so I said, well, you know, we've all agreed this is a terrible idea, um, but, you know, India has been talking about doing this. You know, do you think that you could speak out about this as being not a good idea? Or could you sign up to some general, you know, agreement from this group? And she looked shocked. She said, is, no, this, no. I can't talk about this. Um, and, you know, that was probably one of the easiest cases. So there has to be a much more concerted effort. I don't think it's impossible. I think it's probably, you know. Question there, a very good one. My nephew is involved in a company which claims it can do something like 10 or 100 times higher resolution. So one of the possibilities is to just simply track satellites, but then in addition to end of life, all satellites would have to have capability of moving around a bit. To right. Degree. Right. And so that, that seems like a direction in the future that the, people, the satellites just have to be a lot more capable. Do you agree? Well, that's a, a partial solution, but if, you know, when you get to hundreds of thousands of, of satellites and, you know, the, you know, already we're at tens of thousands of alerts, but, but you know, yeah, but the problem is uh, communication with assurance and having the capability to maneuver. Uh, yeah, and uh, yeah, so there's a lot of, I mean, like the CubeSats, they don't have any maneuvering capability and so on. And so uh, m many communication satellites do, especially in geo, because they're often having to get out of the way. But in general, it's not necessarily easy to arrange. And there's a financial disincentive. Yeah, it's a balance. I mean, so far they haven't seen the benefit of that. <laughs> yes, but the satellite will continue going around in orbit without any steering, and it's in the orbit you want. So it's just the chance that there's a crazy driver out there. <laughs> Well, thanks. That's a good question. So he, he's asked about the Kessler syndrome. So I actually I've been working on this problem since the early 1980s. And so this dates way back then that Kessler was uh, in, the, in NASA and he and his organization uh, pointed out that there's a possibility of an exponential cascade of space debris because of the fact that every interaction generates more debris, which then can generate more debris. And uh, exponential runaway is, is referred to, as you say, as the Kessler syndrome. Um, so there, you know, there's been a lot of detailed studies of this, and there was concern that it might become a serious problem much earlier. But so it's now becoming, there's debate about how close we are, but it seems we're not really there for most of the orbits. But, but the places where we're closest to that cascade is in geo, in geosynchronous orbit, and some of the low Earth orbits that are very favored for certain purposes. And there, the density of spacecraft and debris is becoming very high. And no one knows for sure, and there's simulations about when this cascade would start and run away, but nobody's really sure. But I think we should be cautious because the consequences are so enormous. So we should make sure we don't get close to that. Uh, so, so, so the, the one I'm aware of is the hole in the solar panel. There's also, there was, uh, so the, we don't know what caused that. And, and the one, in the other one, you can see what kind of metal it was that was deposited during the interaction, and it's 
as far as I know, it's sufficiently general use that you can't be absolutely sure. Um, there have been, I mean, other cases where uh, there was uh, damage to a Soviet, a Russian satellite um, that followed from uh, the earlier breakup, and that was pinned down because of the orbit. So you could track the orbit of that particle back and see that it came from that breakup. Uh, but I'm not aware that in the ones for the space station they could do that. Okay, well, let's, let's thank Fred again for a wonderful